morning, Team Alabama. We are ready for a little more of 42, the story about Jackie Robinson. And the official title is 42 is not just a number. Chapter 3, International Day, Summer of 1934. Jack undressed quickly and put on his bathing suit. He and his gang were going to have a chance to cool off today at Pasadena's municipal pool. The Pepper Street Gang, as they called themselves, was a mix of poor black, Mexican, Japanese, and a few white kids. They didn't carry knives or guns or take drugs or drink alcohol. They didn't even have a clubhouse or jackets or a secret handshake. Restricted from activities in the city because of race and money, they had banded together to create their own fun. Jack intended to have lots of fun at the pool this day. The Pepper Street Gang's fun wasn't always legal. They stole fruit from produce stands. They hid out on the local golf course. They scooped up balls that came by and then sold them back to the players. They threw rocks and dirt at passing cars. Once they spread tar on the lawn of a man who had shouted racial slurs at them. When Mally found out about that, she made the boys clean up the mess. Many times Jack had been hauled down to police headquarters for a lecture by the head of the police youth division. Once he had been arrested for swimming in the city reservoir during a heat wave. Today's fun would be completely legal, though it would definitely annoy the white lifeguard. Summer temperatures in Pasadena hovered around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. On most sweltering days, Jack and his friends could only peek through the picket fence around Pasadena's municipal pool and watch the white kids swim. But today was Wednesday, what city officials called International Day. It was the one day a week when, for three hours, blacks, Latinos, and Asians were allowed to swim at the municipal pool. After those three hours were up, the pool would be drained, cleaned, and refilled with fresh water all before the next morning when Pasadena's white citizens would return to swim. The municipal pool was only one of numerous humiliations that blacks faced in Pasadena. There were no white-only signs as there were in the South. There were no white-only signs as there were in the South, but race segregation was still the rule. Jack could get a job washing dishes at Schraff's restaurant, but he wouldn't be allowed to eat at the counter. There were neighborhoods that he knew he wouldn't be safe in. He yearned to use the sports equipment at the YMCA, but membership wasn't open to blacks. Whenever he could, Jack defied segregation. A few times, Jack and a friend sat down at a Woolworth's lunch counter and refused to budge until they were served. More than once, when the lights dimmed in movie theaters, he snuck into the white section. Mama had moved the family to Pasadena because her half-brother, who had settled in California, had told her that if she wanted to get closer to heaven, she should visit California. Jack believed that was true, but only if you were white and wealthy. Bigotry was ingrained in Pasadena schools, yet Jack formed warm bonds with his kindergarten and first grade teachers. As the years passed, however, other white teachers revealed their prejudices. They were often rude and excluded minority students from activities. More than once, Jack and his friends got blamed for trouble that was actually caused by white students. Mama believed education was the one thing white people couldn't take away from a person. That might be true, Jack thought, but no matter how well educated he could become, he knew that the city of Pasadena would never hire him as a police officer or a firefighter or a teacher or a janitor. He and his friends would be lucky if they got jobs picking up garbage. With the afternoon sun beating down on him, Jack climbed the ladder to the highest diving platform. He looked down at the kids swimming and those scattered around the edges of the concrete pool. And then he looked across at the white lifeguard sitting in his high chair, high chair, watching Jack, waiting for him to dive. The lifeguard was in for a surprise. Up and out, Jack jumped as high as he could. He grabbed and hugged his legs close to his chest and he dropped through the air like a bomb, hitting the water with an explosive splash and drenching everyone. 
in and around the pool with his cannonball. Even before Jack surfaced, he knew that the lifeguard was already climbing down from his chair to warn Jack against repeating that stunt. But Wednesday was Jack's day. He was going to cannonball as often as he liked, no matter what the lifeguard said, and no one was going to stop him. Chapter 4, Max Big Challenge It was 3 a.m., but no one in the Robinson family was sleeping. The 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany were underway, and like millions of other Americans, they were huddled around the radio. This year's Olympics were particularly personal for Jack and his family. The American track and field team had two black women and 16 black men on it, three times the number of African Americans who had competed in the previous Olympics. 22-year-old Mac Robinson was one of them. Okay, there are some really great facts that we've just heard. Let's go ahead and add those to our fact list. Okay, it was uh, the 1936 Olympics and Jack's brother, Mac, was competing in it. The Olympics were held in Berlin, Germany. And people huddled around the radio. They kind of ganged up and listened around the radio. Okay. Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler had, be, had built a gigantic stadium in Berlin, confident that German athletes would outshine all others and prove the rightness of his theory that Aryans were the master race. The Olympics were a chance for African-American athletes banned from all professional sports except boxing in their own country to show the United States and the world what they could do. And over the years, when given the chance, black athletes have proved that they were as talented as white athletes. In 1904, George Pope, the first black American on a U.S. Olympic team, won bronze medals in the 200-meter and the 400-meter hurdles. Four years later, John Baxter Taylor won a gold in the 4x400 relay. In the 1924 Olympics, saw three black American medalists. And in the long jump, D. Hart Hubbard won the gold and Ed Gordon won the silver. Earl Johnson won the bronze for the 10,000 meter cross country race. Okay, there are a ton of facts right there on page 13. Those are all things that you could add to your fact list. In 1932, black sprinter Eddie Tolan, the Midnight Express had awed spectators by capturing the gold in the both the 100 and 200 meter races. Ralph Metcalf had won a silver in the 100 meter and bronze in the 200 meter. At Pasadena Junior College, Mack had set national records in the 100 meter and the 200 meter and the long jump. Yet his exceptional achievements had not paved an easy road to Berlin. The United States was still struggling through an economic depression. Money was even scarcer for black Americans than it was for white Americans. That's a pretty good fact. We could add that. It was tougher money-wise for black Americans than white Americans. Most white Olympic athletes had college coaches who trained them in the nuances of their sport, in the styles of the other competitors, so they would know what they were up against. Their colleges paid for all the equipment and travel and living expenses. Even in the best of economic times, few African-American athletes ever enjoyed such backing. Pasadena Junior College didn't have the money to help Mac. Mac hadn't even had the $150 train fare to get from California to New York City for the qualifying trials. Lucky for him, some Pasadena business people got together and donated the train fare, but they hadn't given him money for new running shoes. Mac was still trying, still was still stuck running in battered spikes that pinched his toes. So just getting to the train station and getting there was a tough thing for him. The announcer called the names of the runners in the 200-meter dash. Among them was American Jesse Owens, who would be Mac's fiercest competitor. Owens' extraordinary accomplishments were well known. In high school, he matched the world record in the 100-yard dash, and at the 1935 NCAA championships, he won the 100-yard dash, tying the world mark. Ten minutes later, he broke the world record in the long jump. 
Nine minutes after that, he set another world record in the 220-yard dash. And several minutes later, he broke another world record in the low hurdles. He won the same four events at the Big Ten Track and Field Championships in Michigan the following May. He was fast, but so was Mac. The pistol sounded and the runners were off. Before Jack knew it, the announcer was booming the names of the winners. Jesse Owens first with a gold medal, his time 20.7 seconds. Behind Owens by four tenths of a second, Mac Robinson had captured the silver. There was no end to the joy and pride in the Robinson home that morning. Out of the total of 56 medals won by the United States in the 1936 Olympics, 14 were won in track and field. Black athletes won all 14. Eight of the 14 medals were gold. Mack and his teammates had a triumphant post-Olympic tour in Europe. Competing in many events and in Paris, Mack tied the world record in a 200-meter race. Okay, these are all great facts. So go back and look at page 14 and 15 if you want to add those to your um, fact list. But when the Olympic silver medalists returned home to Pasadena, there were no ticker tape parades. The city ignored Mac's accomplishments. And the Olympics behind him, the star athlete needed a job and found himself sweeping the streets of Pasadena on a night shift. Okay, so that's pretty terrible. He wasn't ever acknowledged or he wasn't acknowledged when he returned for all of his um, accomplishments, all of those medals that he received. Um, go ahead and add some more facts about different people from page 14 and 15 and even 13. There are a lot of great facts there that you can add. We're going to stop there for today, Team Alabama. Have a great rest of your day. If you need to get caught up on some of your writing, this is a great time to use this to finish up that ocean debris essay. Have a great rest of your day.